again everyone thanks for being here um, we really need um, this this endeavor really needs uh, a community behind it you know we really need uh, uh, support from so many places and, and just having you all here is a big big support so thanks for joining us um, <clears throat> some of you will remember the story of the endeavor which was Ernest Shackleton and his um, 
attempt to be the first crew that would walk across Antarctica. So kind of a harebrained idea in a way, but this is what inspired him to do. This is over 100 years ago. So you've probably heard the story. If you haven't, it's actually very, very interesting and fun to contemplate their time. But what he did to get his crew was he put an ad in the paper. And I wanted to read you that. So he said, Wanted for arduous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. So here we are. It's all true except for the honor and recognition. But we appreciate all of you who have it, who understand this idea of community intuitively and get that it's important. It's so easy right now to be pessimistic about our society. And we really have to guard against that hypnosis. We are incredibly capable beings. We have incredible potential. The things we have accomplished as a species already are monumental. And there's so much we can do. We really just haven't paid enough attention to this very basic building block of community wellness that is community, that is intention behind our relationships to each other, to spirit, to ourselves, to the planet. And so our attempt is to bring that into focus and find a group of people who resonate with that process and really want to share a journey that would really focus on that. When Yogananda first started his public work, he started a school. And the ideal of his education was how to live. And really, this is the question we're asking, how to live. It's a very new time in our lives, the amount of change that there's been in the last 50 years, even 10 years. We have so much to digest about how fast everything is evolving and changing. And I think that's a very useful and important question. How should we live? And we need to ask it together. We need to ask it as a community. And we need to solve problems together. It's so obvious in a way that we can no longer address the problems we have without a lot of cooperation and a lot of interconnection and a lot of depth of really friendship and understanding that this is how we're going to solve the problems that are in front of us. So let me check this before I introduce everyone. It's a good time to be humble, I think, to be receptive, to be open, to listen. And I think this is a real important part of anything we try right now. Because we've tried the other way. We've tried charging off with our best ideas. I think it is a really good time to meditate, to receive, to try to deeply understand why we're here and what we're doing here. And so to that end, we have gathered today three speakers from three very distinct traditions, but all of whom have a depth of experience in community and spirituality. And so tonight, we're going to just hear from them and listen. And each of them will talk about 15 minutes or so. And then we'll have time for questions and answers and discussion afterward. And we'll see if we end with a little more music. That's always a good thing to end with, but we'll see how it all unfolds here. And then also, I have to mention a few practical things. Thanks, Terry. 
Um, so the weekend is full of fun events, and uh, let me let me read them to you. Um, tomorrow morning, if you're so inclined, we're having meditation on the land. So this will be from 7 to 8.30 there. And we put up a little pavilion we call the Temple of Trees, so you can join us there for meditation. There'll be a little bit of chanting at the beginning, and we'll close with healing prayers at the end, which is which is our tradition. So please join us for that if you can. Soon after that, the meditation ends at 8.30. At 9 o'clock, we're going to have a uh, discussion about the vision of Polestar Village and then a tour of the land. So we'll get to walk around the land. Um, my um, son-in-law made me this wonderful little app where he's got an icon and he's got my the whole map of the village located there. And you can walk anywhere in the village and see exactly where you are. You know? So it's really kind of fun. So we can share that with you and, um, and answer questions. So this is really just a, a meeting to answer any and all questions and discuss the vision, what we're, what we're trying to do. And then um, that, then in the afternoon, we're gonna have tea with Asha, nice mommy, yay. <laughs> so if you haven't met her yet, you can look forward to meeting her and hanging out with her. Delightful, delightful person to spend time with. And I don't know what happens at teas, actually, but I'm going to one tomorrow. <laughs> we'll find out tomorrow. <laughs> and I hear Gangamata is making treats, so. <laughs> in itself is, is worth the journey. So um, then uh, Saturday night is our kirtan. And um, for those of you who aren't familiar with kirtan, it's basically chanting and sacred music. So at, at Polestar, we're kind of collectors of, of, of music that we love. And um, there's a lot of music from our tradition and the music from many other traditions that we integrate. So, so uh, Join us for that. That begins at 7 o'clock at the Unity on Vine Church. And this whole schedule is in the back on a little uh, sandwich board, and you can take a picture of it. That would be a great way to have it with you at all times for the weekend. Sunday morning, and this is especially for some people who are new to Fort Collins, um, there's a, a hike that starts at the land, and there's a bike hike if you're interested in that. I've got a few extra bikes. And also rent bikes. So if you're interested in the bike part, let me know and I'll get you the details on that. Uh, Fort Collins is called a platinum city for biking. Platinum rated city. And it's because the bike trails are to die for. And the, and the roads are designed to accommodate biking. And it's, it's so wonderful um, to just be on a bike instead of a car. <laughs> so um, that'll be in the morning, uh, starting at around 9 o'clock. And then we're going to meet at what's called Old Town at the Little Bird Cafe at about 10.30. So our, our bikers will bike there, and then we can bike back. So uh, that'll be fun. Our hikers will take a hike from the land, do a loop, come back, and then drive there if you, if you wish to. And if you haven't been to Old Town yet in Fort Collins, you're also in for a treat. It's really, really a wonderful place. So um, the main event, however, is Sunday at two o'clock, which is our actual ceremony and dedication. And we have about 10 spiritual leaders from different traditions sharing some form of sacredness and blessing on our land. And, and so I uh, want to invite you all to be there. There'll be music and uh, a little ceremony and uh, what we call in Hawaii, uh, poo-poos, which are basically hors d'oeuvres, poo. <laughs> so. Followed by poopoos is usually the joke <laughs> in Hawaii. So um, I think that's, did I cover it all? Oh, Sunday night is pickleball. Mm -hmm. Say it again. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you very much. Um, we have kind of a, uh, I've been calling it log hinge. It's a bunch of logs and uh, stumps that have been piled and arranged and, and uh, we're doing kind of a nature altar there. So if you have anything sacred you would like to bring to it, please bring it. Could even be a picture of a, a relative you want to remember or anything that, it, that evokes uh, sacredness and deep meaning to you. Uh, feel free to bring that. And, um, and then Sunday night at 7 o'clock is the Pole Star Pickleball Party. 
So if you haven't uh, got the bug yet and you'd like to try it, even if you're a beginner, you're welcome to come out. It'll be at 7 o'clock at the uh, Spring Canyon Park. And uh, we can play under the lights there. It's really, really kind of great fun. So um, I think that's all I have to say except to introduce these three over here. And thank you three again for being here. really appreciate it. Uh, Bruce is going to go first, and Bruce is with the Thich Nhat Hanh community, and uh, has been uh, in the Buddhist tradition. So um, they, like us, value community deeply and know the importance of it. And, and so Bruce is going to share first. And then this is Pastor Steve from the Grassroots Church. Did I say that right? Fort Collins Mennonite Fellowship. Oh, I got it wrong. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Quite wrong. Yeah. From the Fort Collins Mennonite <laughs> Fellowship. And uh, Steve has been a really sweet connection. Uh, he invited me about a month ago to speak at their church, which, which was wonderful for me. Um, and, and there was a great spirit there, and it was just heart opening to see these people. They moved out of their church so that homeless people can live in their church, so that so the service is in the in the park next to the church, you know. So um, they really do a lot of community building there, and Steve has lived in intentional community. And then this is Asha Nayaswamy, a dear friend for many years, probably known her 40 years or something like that. And uh, she hails from Ananda Village in Northern California, and she is the spiritual director of Ananda Palo Alto, and also a uh, Global ambassador. <laughs> well, actually, this is significant. She is starting on a world tour, as if I understand it correctly, and this is her first stop. So we, we are honored, honestly. <laughs> we, we really are. And uh, she's widely known as one of the best speakers at Amanda, so not to <laughs> But I agree. So um, anyway, thank you all again, and I'll hand it over to Bruce. Before I stand, in our tradition, we usually begin our um, our discussions with three sounds of the bell. So this is an opportunity to, I'll invite the bell and it's an opportunity to return to ourselves and to settle. So maybe I will use the uh, lectern. I do have a cheat sheet here. So it's kind of bulky. Let me, uh... So usually also, if we're, we're doing something ceremonial, we start with uh, invocations. And um, I want to start by inviting um, the traditional people of this land into this room, so our, our uh, land ancestors. And I'm going to read an acknowledgement, uh, part of an acknowledgement from, from CSU. I sometimes get a little choked up when I read this, so that happens, it happens. We acknowledge with respect that the land we are on today is the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute nations and peoples. This was also a site of trade, gathering, and healing for numerous other native tribes. We recognize the indigenous peoples as original stewards of this land and all the relatives within it. As these, wor <clears throat> this is the hard part. As these words of acknowledgement are spoken and heard, the ties nations have to their traditional homelands 
are renewed <clears throat> and reaffirmed. So I'd also like to invite in this room, um, and I'll talk a little about this in a minute, but I'd like to invite the pole star land into this room. And that might seem like sort of a funny concept. Um, but it's something that occurred to me this week that the land is actually part of our community. It's a very important part of our community. We're in, we're in relationship with it. So, so I would like to, I'd like to invite the land here with us tonight. And maybe just take a moment, if you've been to the Pole Star Land, and you can visualize it. And you can invite the spirit if you haven't, maybe you've seen pictures. But let's just take a minute and invite the land to be with us. So maybe just some, some quick um, background or by way of introduction. So I've been practicing with Thich Nhat Hanh's community. We call Thich Nhat Hanh Thai, which means teacher in Vietnam. So I might, I'll probably refer to him as Thai. But I've been practicing with his community for, for about 20 years. I have this, uh, what we call brown jacket on because I'm the member of something called the Order of Interbeing, which is um, essentially, it's, it's kind of a, it's a leadership community and uh, it's people who have taken essentially what Buddhists refer to as the Bodhisattva vow, so an aspiration or a vow to dedicate our lives to serving all living beings. Um, I'm also a member of the Thich Nhat Hanh Foundation Board, and I lived for a year at uh, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh's core monastery in France, so I had an experience also living in, in spiritual community. Actually, I'm curious, how, how many others here have lived in spiritual community before? Okay, great. Um, so as Michael, as Michael said, in, in the Buddhist tradition, uh, community is, is very important. The, in Buddhism, we talk about something called the three jewels. And the three jewels are, are kind of three foundations of our practice. And they are the, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And so Sangha uh, means community, community essentially. So, so Sangha is one of the, the three foundations of our practice. We also talk about if you decide to formally become a Buddhist, you actually take what we call refuge vows, and you take refuge in the three jewels. And so one thing we do when, when we kind of formally commit to being a Buddhist what that, whatever that means. Um, we take refuge in the Sangha. And this, this idea of refuge, I think, is a very beautiful one, right? It's, it's this idea of we're coming back to something that offers protection and safety, um, some place that we're rooted. So, so the Sangha community is something we take refuge in. And Ty talks uh, so often about, about the importance of community. And he, he really... Uh, emphasizes something that was really essential to spiritual practice and spiritual life was to be a part of a part of community. And I'll talk a little bit about why that is. You know what it is about community that is so important or that supports our practice. Um, but just to kind of plant that seed that this, at least you know, in Thich Nhat Hanh's vision, community was absolutely essential to to our practice. So I do, um, I'm mostly sort of a, kind of a background bodhisattva. I don't, I don't actually do a lot of speaking. I don't, I don't, um, there's a formal teaching transmission in our community. I have not received that, that transmission. So I don't necessarily consider myself a teacher. Uh, so I'm going to be speaking really from my own experience. Um, so as I was, you know, kind of thinking about what I would offer tonight, I was, uh, Sort of in my head about it earlier in the week, I was, you know, I was writing notes and I was, you know, had my stack of books out uh, that I was referring to, and um, and I was feeling a little stuck about it. Um, and then uh, the other night, was it? I think it was Wednesday or third Wednesday. I woke up at 2:30 in the morning, I think, and um, and I just I had this sort of felt sense of a couple of things. 
that I, I realized I wanted to be the center of this, you know, the thoughts that I would share, and it was really sort of something coming out of my subconscious and um, making itself aware to me, I think. And the, the, first, the first thing that, that I experienced at you know, 2.33 in the morning was I had this really felt sense that, um, you know, we talk about this weekend as us blessing the land. And I had this felt sense that, of how the land blesses us. And I had this sense that uh, the land is inviting us to be here, that the land is in partnership with us. And, um, and you know, it's interesting, and I think one reason that was in my subconscious, I've been reading this wonderful book um, called Braiding Sweetgrass by, by Robin Wall Kimmerer. And one question she asks or she challenges us with is, what if, what if the land loves us? What if the earth loves us? If we talk about how we love the earth, you know, we're nature enthusiasts, or we're, we appreciate nature and we love the earth. But what if we thought of how the earth loves us? And um, and so I think that was, that got in that got into me, and I and so I was thinking, what is the relationship with this land? And what if the land loves us? And what if the land is inviting us here? And what if what if the land is the origin story? I mean, we we, we think of the story of Pole Star as um, you know Dennis and Bailey inviting you know the Pole Star crew to to um, kind of take over stewardship of the land. But maybe the land is inviting all of us. Maybe it started it, so. or she started it. Maybe I don't I don't know what pronouns. <laughs> <laughs> she feels kind of right. They, she, they, 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 they all pronouns. Um, and so, you know, I thought of braiding sweetgrass. Uh, that was my set. And then I, and I thought, well, how does this? What is this? Ha- like, is there a connection to Thich Nhat Hanh's practice? And um, and I, re- I remembered another thing we do when we start our our ceremonies is we do um, a series of prostrations. We, we call them touching the earth. And when we do these prostrations, we 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 honor um, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. And um, and one of one of the beings that we honor, and I thought of this, um, one of the beings we honor is Mother Earth. And so we do, we animate, we recognize the Earth as a living thing, as a living being. And I, I just want to read um, what we say when we do the prostration to Mother Earth. We say, Mother of Buddhas, Bodhisattva. Sorry, Mother of Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and all beings, nourishing, holding, and healing all. Bodhisattva Gaya, Great Mother Earth, precious jewel of the cosmos, to whom we bow in gratitude. And also, it's interesting. There's this idea with the three jewels in Sangha, and we we also hear about Mother Earth as a jewel, a jewel. Of so again, there's a connection of Mother Earth and community sangha, us being in community together. And I also thought about um, the blessings that the land has already offered, and I, 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 I wanted to offer back blessings the land has already offered to me in this short time that I've known it and known her. Um, and so I wanted to acknowledge those and also express gratitude, and I think and thinking about the blessings that I've already received from the land. Really, I think the biggest one is just the people that I've met as part of the community that is, that is gathering and is becoming around this land. And, you know, people have become good spiritual friends and, and uh, have become special to me and that I'm really honored to sort of be a part of or help however I can in the, in the kind of the journey that's happening here. So, so I really want to thank the land for the people that I've been introduced to as a part of being in, in relationship with her. The other, the other um, kind of you know vision or feeling I had the other night when I woke up in the middle of the night was um, this other passage occurred to me from uh, from one of the opening parts of our, our ceremonies, and uh, and I think I'll go ahead and read this because because the words just just came to me. 
as I was lying in bed, but uh, they are. The one who bows and the one who is bowed to are both by nature empty. Therefore, the communication between them is inexpressibly perfect. Our practice center is the net of Indra, reflecting all Buddhas everywhere. And, in, and with my person in front of each Buddha, I go with my whole life for refuge. And the net of Indra is, um, the imagery there is of this net that surrounds the entire world, uh, you know, our entire existence. And each, in each eye of the net, so in each place where the net intersects, there's a jewel. Again, the jewel, but there's a jewel in the eye of, of uh, and then of each part of the net, and that jewel reflects all the other jewels. So in each, each jewel in the net, you can see all the other jewels at once. And so it's this idea of inner being or inner, inner penetration, this idea that in one of us is all of us, right? So there's no separation. You know, if I, I look at Stephanie, I see the whole universe, right? Um, and I think, and I think what maybe why this spoke to me too was the idea of our practice center being the idea of this the, the practice center being the net of interest, so that a physical place that we practice together, a phys physical place we have spiritual community, this is a place where we can see in each other all of existence, and this is a place where we can see in each other the way that we inter are and interpenetrate each other and are interconnected. And it's also a place that um, we meet each other as Buddhas. You know, in, in, um, in our tradition, we say that everyone has Buddha nature. We are all, we are all the nature to be Buddhas. And so, so the imagery I had really was us of us being in this room or being in the forums that we are together over this weekend, and all of us being brilliant Buddhas, all of us shining light on one another. Um, and ultimately that, also when you bring all that light together, it shines out onto the world, right? Um, and that's something Michael was talking about, about, about bringing, bringing hope into the world. Um, <coughs> I will say also, you know, with the net of Indra, again, this jewel, something precious. You know, also when I was thinking about Sangha as a jewel and thinking about the significance of the jewel, but it's also something precious, it's something rare, it's something that we need to really treasure, right? This is not um, not something to be taken for, for granted. So I just want to end maybe by uh, talking a little bit about my experience in spiritual community and what it meant for me and why it continues to be important to me and why I would put energy into something like Polestar. Um, and two words came to me when I was when I was thinking about kind of what was most important for me in spiritual community. And the, the first word is, is connection. And uh, I mean to me, you know, when I when I was living in community in France, one of the things that I was finding frustrating about life um, before living in spiritual community, find it frustrating again living out of it is is how how my encounters had to be planned. You know, if I wanted to see my friend, it was you know emails or text messages, or we had to we had to find a time to meet each other, and it was always difficult because of our busy schedules. And and often my friends didn't live anywhere close to me, so my closest friends may be on the other side of town or in a different city, or right. And and so I just and I, I felt. And I had my, you know, one place I lived in a neighborhood, um, you know, my spiritual community was somewhere else, my work community was somewhere else, and I just felt very disaggregated and dis disconnected and and uh, and lonely, frankly, I think, you know. And, and one of the things I really valued about spiritual, about living in community with people was it was, it was, it was kind of instant on connection. I mean, really any part of the day, um, I could walk into the, I could walk in the community center and I would, I could find, I could find someone to connect with. There was life there. You know, I didn't have to schedule a time to be with somebody. I didn't, have, we didn't have to check calendars. Um, and then there was also connection through ritual. I mean, I think one of the things that I find 
Um, again, I think um, lacking in my day-to-day -day life in, in sort of the quote-unquote normal world is a, is a lack of ritual and a lack of being able to practice, do spiritual practice together. So it was so powerful for me to be able to start and end my day, you know, if I wanted it every day, doing it, you know, doing a, a practice with my community, you know, meditation, and then being able to sing together, being able to walk together, being able to eat together. And all these things, you know, brought a sense of connection and wholeness to my life. Um, and the other, the other thing, uh, in addition to connection, the other word that came to me was, was fortitude. And I, and I thought about that thought, fortitude, I thought, doesn't sound very Buddhist in a way, because it's like, Fortitude, you know, and and so I looked up the so I actually looked up the definition. Um, it says fortitude is the strength of mind that enables a person to encounter danger or bear pain or adversity with courage. And I thought, you know what? Actually, that is what we need because I mean the truth is like the predominant culture is toxic, you know. It's um, and it's powerful, you know, it's, it's sticky, it's compelling. And, um, you know, the other thing I found in living in spiritual community, I just found that I was, you know, I have these ideas of the way that I want to be in the world that are formed in part by my spiritual practice. And it's often so hard for me to embody that, to be that kind of person. And part of the problem is all the resistance that I find in again, kind of predominant mainstream culture. And, and so there's something about being in community that brings that strength of mind, that fortitude, um, to be able to realize my aspirations you know, as, a, as, a, as a spiritual person. And in closing, I don't know, I feel like maybe I'm taking a long time, but in closing, um, in closing, I just want to offer, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh, this version of Buddhism we practice is, is, a, is a Zen tradition, so there's not, you know, which Zen is very much like, it's here, it's now, it's realizable, there's not a lot of kind of hocus pocus. Um, and, um, but, but Thich Nhat Hanh would talk about, um, so I guess in sort of Buddhist scripture, more conventional, traditional Buddhist scripture, there is this idea of uh, the next Buddha called Maitreya will come and be with us. And the idea is that Maitreya will come once the world has disintegrated to such an extent that um, everybody has forgotten the Dharma, everyone has forgotten spiritual practice. And Maitreya will come and lift us back up and kind of renew um, our spiritual life. And Thich Nhat Hanh used to say that in his, in his belief that the Maitreya would be the Sangha, Maitreya would be community. And, and that really, so it was up to us to save ourselves, you know? Um, and, uh, and, he, and so when he would talk about it in the future, that my trailer will be us, and I, I've decided, I don't know who is authorized to do this, but I, I've decided that my tray is here. Like, <laughs> it's now, it's happening. Like, like we, we, we are it. Thank you. on. <laughs> Mennonites come from the branch, if you say, you know, there's the Catholic branch of the Christian tree, and there's the Orthodox branch of the Christian tree, and then there's the Protestant branch. We come from that group of Protestants, and trace our beginnings to the 16th century. We're actually going to, in a few years, celebrate 500 years of the Anabaptist movement. And for the Anabaptists, community was probably one of the greatest legacies that we as Mennonites have inherited. For them, in the 16th century, community was not merely a convenient way to care for one another or to share resources, 
but community was crucial for their very survival. For you see, the community of believers, as they called themselves, arose from the conviction that no single individual can really follow the hard teachings of Jesus. We believe that Jesus meant what he said and said what he meant. And we're supposed to follow them. Now, a community of support is necessary. A community of accountability. A community of forgiveness was necessary in order for those early believers to be to remain faithful. We can't do it alone. And they did this as they were being arrested by both Catholic nations and Protestant nations. They were being arrested, tortured, and killed. But they also believed that community was where the voice of God spoke and was understood. God's word in the Bible, as well as the contemporaneous leadings of what we call the Holy Spirit, could only be fully understood or discerned within the larger community. Because it was the community that tested the truth. If God speaks, God speaks to many of us, not just one of us. Now to be sure, the early Anabaptists and those of us Mennonites who inherited that tradition, we have failed heartily many times at this endeavor. Too often we've turned accountability into abusive legalism. Too often we've failed to listen to our own dissenters and have also chosen the easier way out of just separating and dividing. We multiply by dividing. That makes sense if you think about it. <laughs> we do that rather than the hard work of maintaining unity. And far too often our endeavor to be a peculiar people, we're related to the Amish, <laughs> To be in a peculiar people has often, too often, been that we've remained just odd for the wrong reasons. <laughs> but some good things have also managed to, to survive, such as the belief that all of us are called to be priests or ministers of the gospel, and that power within the body must be shared equally without regards to social status. And for the most part, we have maintained what I call a healthy mistrust of the larger society of earthly rulers and kingdoms as we seek our primary allegiance to the higher calling of being a part of God's kingdom rule. Another major inspiration for me and my experience of community have been the writings of M. Scott Peck, who wrote a massive bestseller called um, The Road Less Traveled many, many years ago. But he also wrote another book called The Different Drum, Community and Peacemaking. And he opens his uh, introduction to this book with a rather audacious sentence. He says, in and through community is the salvation of the world. Two sentences. Nothing is more important. <laughs> that in mind. <laughs> Pole star. <laughs> looking at you. <laughs> and even though this was written over 30 years ago under what then was a very real threat of nuclear annihilation, I do still believe it's true. For it is true, for it is in true community that we become part of something 
greater than ourselves. And that will open us up to fuller, to a much fuller experience of the divine. Spiritually based community, therefore, are indeed one of the best antidotes for the rampant alienation and separation that we experience in this world, especially here in the Western nations of the world. But make no mistake, any journey towards true community can be, and probably should be, a little scary, like Shackleton's <laughs> crew. <clears throat> because those of us who've tried to go there have found it fraught both with perils and failures, as well as joy. In a nearly impossible endeavor, Peck lists eight characteristics of true communities. He says they are inclusive, realistic, contemplative, safe, a laboratory for personal disarmament, a group that fights gracefully, a group that is made up of all leaders, and finally, community is a spirit. I find these characteristics, I find that they ring true in my own personal experience. And they're actually kind of practical. True community must be inclusive. Unfortunately, most Christian churches tend to be the opposite in my experience. However, Jesus calls us to build communities with the outcasts of society, the poor, the sick, the homeless, the thieves, the adulterers, and even tax collectors. Jesus also consistently attacked those social structures that excluded others, especially those at the bottom of society. Yes, maybe there certainly need to be limits to inclusion, but Peck stresses that true communities always reach out to extend themselves. Exclusivity, he adds, is the greatest enemy of community. Communities do not ask, how can we justify taking this person in? But rather, the question is, is it justifiable to keep this person out? True community not only takes commitment and hard work, it also requires that we hang in there together when the going gets tough. Theologically, we Christians would say that true community seeks to transcend or literally get over our differences rather than obliterate, convert, or ignore them. True communities must also be realistic he says, because a community includes members with many different points of view and the freedom to express them, it comes to appreciate the whole of a situation far better than any individual can. In our Gospels, usually it is the sinner who has the most realistic self-evaluation. After all, it is those who know that they are sick, who seek out a doctor. It is when we account for our own inadequacies and imperfections, as well as our strengths, that we begin to journey towards wholeness. Contemplation is a great way to maintain humility. Now, we Mennonites pride ourselves in being humble. <laughs> But like a lot of Christians, we are not very contemplative. Communities such as you all, all right, that practice and promote meditation are desperately needed to help many of us recapture what was actually once a very vibrant Christian practice of meditation. True communities must also be safe places. A safe place for tears, fears, 
pain, forgiveness, and a real heartfelt joy. Belly laughs. They are places where we can finally lay down our guard and open ourselves to become truly vulnerable. Feeling truly safe is a rare experience for most in this society. Is that an amen? Amen. amen. Instead, we spend so much of our time and energy trying to project false exteriors, and yet true safety actually comes when we disassemble those facades and break down the barriers between us through true vulnerability. Peck adds, paradoxically then, a group of humans actually becomes healing and converting only after they have learned to stop trying to be healing and converting. <laughs> True communities are laboratories of personal disarmament. Vulnerability is a two-way street. We must be willing to both expose our wounds as well as become deeply affected by the wounds of others. Good laboratories are safe places for experimentation, and so true communities then are safe places to begin the experiment more deeply than ever before with the critical necessaries of life, like love and trust. True communities also, he says, are made up of folks that can fight gracefully. You all fight? Didn't play football. Never. <laughs> Mennonites are pacifists. We hate fighting and conflict. So we have not done this one very well. In our attempts to be peaceful, we end up avoiding conflict and direct communication and end up being passive aggressive instead, which never happens in community. In genuine community, there should be no sides, cliques, or factions, but there will be conflicts. Even healthy communities are, after all, made up of real human beings, and so even intense agreements will arise, but since there is mutual respect, true learning, and healthy compromise can occur. A true community is a group where everyone is a leader. Now, one of the central values that our church, we have written, says that everyone in the group is a minister. From our very beginnings in the 16th century, pastors have been called to be simply that, shepherds that guide the flock. In our fellowship, decisions are made by consensus, and leadership is shared as well as routinely rotated. Peck's final characteristic is that true communities are a spirit. It is a spiritual endeavor that must be infused at all levels by beliefs and spiritual practices. The spirit of true community is the spirit of peace, Peck says, and peace for followers of Jesus derives from the Hebrew word shalom. The word shalom should be translated as not simply the absence of conflict, but the sense of well-being for each and every part of God's creation. That's shalom. But the spirit, in Peck's words, is also slippery and does not submit itself to definition or to be captured in a way that other materials, things are. True community may not always feel peaceful and it will not always be free of difficulties and hard times. There will be struggles and they will be hard but ultimately they will lead us to growth. Not only growth of the community, but growth of the individual as well. But those of us who seek to follow a spiritual path believe that we are not alone, left merely to our own devices to travel that path. Some of us also believe that true community is 
the very essence of God. You've heard that already. So allow me to finish my comments by wading into a little bit more Christian theology. Sorry. Now I must admit the classical Christian doctrine of the Trinity never really made much sense to me. That was until I started reading a Catholic priest a few years ago named Richard Rohr, who literally blew my mind, helping me to understand why that doctrine is important. If God is really a being that is seeking to have a real relationship with us, rather than being some far distant and usually angry monarch, okay, which is unfortunately what a lot of Christians believe, if God really wants relationships, perhaps then the members of the Trinity are actually a community. Their God is in community with God's self. God is really three distinct yet very fully unified, holding hands in a circle, dancing. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or as I'd rather, as I prefer to recite, God the Creator, God the Redeemer, and God the Sustainer, in perfect relationship with one another, with no hierarchy, no position, no difference in efficacy, their roles flowing continually from one to the next, to the next, back again. Pure joy, love, and relationship flowing seamlessly from one to the other. Yes, it is still a mystery to be sure, and one that my simple human mind may never fully understand. Especially for those of us raised in Western styles of thought that are so linear and often very rigid. They're not circles, they're squares and triangles, right? But the important thing is we, that we must keep in mind is not the intellectual. No, you got that right. The thing we need to keep in mind is not the intellectual understanding, but it is our actual participation in the dance. It's in that flow that is the divine that we must participate. God is relationship. God is dance. God is flow. And thus, God is true community. We are then simply invited to join the dance, to participate in the flow. The dance is capitalized. The flow and part of divine community. And when that is found, the world is saved. We are saved. <laughs> I can uh, just hold this in my hand. I'm extremely happy to be here with all of you. It means... It means a great deal to me to be anywhere where people are really looking to move more into the light and to find ways to just live in this world that will bring us more of what all of our hearts are looking for. And there's also um, anybody who pays any attention. The need is urgent. And it's not so much urgent because I think all of us as little egos are actually in charge. The very good news is that we're not. The good news is that we're part of a great stream of divine energy which is working its will through us. And that all of us, though, stand every minute of our lives at a moment of choice. 
which is, I prefer not to sing light and darkness. My favorite way of saying it is there's light and there's shadow. Because even for shadow to exist, there has to be light. And all that shadow actually is, is that somehow something has blocked the light. But we know that even if the light is tremendously blocked, it's not actually affected or extinguished. And what we're seeing in our world now, um, I, uh, Michael mentioned I'm part of Ananda, which is a community based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda, a very well-known book, Autobiography of a Yogi. He had a direct disciple in America.